This morning, we're going to start um, somewhat of a summer series on prayer. Uh, we're going to be looking at prayer in detail. Uh, we have a few weeks, and we don't have holiday. So uh, we're going to spend these few weeks concentrating on prayer. And what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the prayer that Jesus prayed. It's sometimes referred to as the high priestly prayer. It's found in John chapter 17. After that, we're going to take a look at the Lord's Prayer in detail and the example that, that Jesus gave us as to how we should pray. And then we're going to wind up the series looking at the purpose of prayer. We're going to look at what inhibits our prayer. And we're going to look at some other biblical instructions about prayer. But of course, prayer, there's so much about prayer in the Bible that we're just not going to be able to cover it all. If we did, this would be what we would call a never-ending series. Because it would just go on. If we tried to cover every scripture about prayer, we'd be here past Christmas. So this morning, since we're going to talk about prayer, I want to open in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be in your house. Father, it's an honor and a privilege for us in America to be able to gather together on a Sunday morning to look at your word, to, to worship and fellowship together, Father. Lord, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who came and gave his life so that we may have the freedom from sin. We thank him so that we may have for his sacrifices so that we may have the freedom to gather and to worship. Thank you, Father, for the men and women of our country that have sacrificed so that we can have the freedom that we still enjoy, Father. While that freedom may be in jeopardy, we still thank you, Father, for the freedom that we currently have. We thank you, Father, for those that are here this morning. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who aren't for whatever reason, Lord. We know that you know their needs, Father, so we just place them at your feet, and we ask that you would answer them according to your will. Father, be with me this morning, Father, as I deliver your message. Father, speak through me. Don't let it be my words that come out of my mouth, because it's your words, Father. And we ask you these things in Christ's name. Amen. John Bunyan said, You can do no more than pray after you've had prayer, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. E. Stanley Jones said, Prayer is surrender. Surrender to the will of God in cooperation with that will. If I throw a boat rope from the boat and catch hold of the shore and pull, do I pull the shore to me? Or do I pull myself to the shore? Prayer is not pulling God to my will, but aligning my will to the will of God. Martin Luther said, it's a good thing to let prayer be the first business in the morning and the last in the evening. Samuel Chadwick said, The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Ethel Barrymore said, when life knocks you to your knees, well, that's the best position in which to pray, isn't it? These are some great quotes about prayer. Some, some ideas that we need to apply to our lives. Because prayer is essential in the life of a Christian. It's how we communicate to God. If we're not communicating with God... How can we say we have a relationship with Him? And when you look at your, your family and your friends, you communicate with them. You have a relationship with them because you communicate. There's communication back and forth. Well, through the Word, through the Bible, God communicates to us. But if there's no communication from our side, we don't have a relationship with Him. And prayer is our communication with God. Now, the, the purpose of this series is to show how important 
a strong prayer life is. And hopefully it encourages each and every one of us to develop a stronger prayer life. So let's look at some of the times when Jesus prayed. And Jesus spent a considerable amount of time in prayer. <coughs> There's so much that we can learn from the times when he prayed. But of course, like I said, we can't look at every time because we'd be here forever. But the first one that I want to look at is just before he chose the 12 apostles out of his many disciples. We find that in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. It says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent all night praying to God. First and foremost, Jesus went and found a solitary place, a place where he could be alone to pray. And also, as we get into the series, you'll see that there's a lot of things that repeat themselves when we talk about prayer. One of the things is find a place to be by yourself. Now, we also need to notice that he didn't just spend a few minutes in prayer. He didn't just spend an hour or two praying about this choice that he was having to make. He spent an entire night in prayer. He was facing a very important decision. He had to select 12 men to carry his gospel to the world. These 12 men would be responsible for establishing Christ's church after he had ascended into heaven. The selection of these 12 men was one of the most important decisions that Christ had to make on this earth as a human because his church would live or die depending on these 12 men. Jesus wanted to make sure that he chose the 12 men that God had selected. See, at this time, he had thousands upon thousands of men to choose from. And he had to get just the right 12. And because of the importance of this decision, Christ spent all night in prayer. Without the right 12 men, Jesus wouldn't have been able to fulfill his mission. Without Judas Iscariot, Jesus might not have been betrayed, arrested, tried, and crucified. Without the other 11, the gospel might not have been spread the way it's been spread. Christ's church may have died with Christ if it weren't for the right people. So what does this mean to us? What does this tell us? Well, let me start by asking you this. How much time do you spend in prayer when you have an important, life-changing decision to make? Do you spend a few minutes in prayer? Maybe an hour or two? Or do you spend all night in prayer? See, many of us spend just a few minutes in prayer, which is why sometimes we make the wrong decisions. We don't, see, we don't spend enough time seeking God's will. When we have important decisions to make, we need to be like Christ and spend a considerable amount of time in prayer. We need to ask God to guide us in the decisions that we have to make. We need to ask God to guide us in the direction He wants us to go. See, so if we want our decision to align with the will of God, we better spend time in prayer seeking that will. We better spend time in prayer seeking God's guidance and seeking peace with our decision. Somebody once told me recently, they said, if you have to think about it, if you have to struggle over it, if you have to fight with yourself about it, it's probably not the right decision. So when we have an important decision we need to make, we need to spend time on our knees in prayer. Another time that Jesus prayed was when He fed the 5,000 in Luke chapter 9. Verse 16, it says, Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to the disciples and set them before the people. Now, Jesus didn't have to pray for this miracle. Jesus was God. He didn't have to ask God for a miracle. But before he performed this miracle, he gave thanks for what God had provided now understand that without these two fish and the five loaves, Jesus could have easily fed these people. 
But God provided this small provision for him. And because of what God had provided, Jesus gave thanks. So let me ask you this. What has God provided for you that you forgot to thank Him for? What if you woke up tomorrow with just what you had thanked God for today? Well, if you're not praying, if you don't have a, if you're not spending time in prayer, you're most likely not thanking God for what He's provided for you. Before Jesus could provide more for the five thousand. He thanked God for what he already had. Before we go looking and seeking and working for more, we need to thank God for what he's already given us. And we also need to understand that everything belongs to him. And because everything belongs to him, and it belongs to him because he created it, then he decides who gets what and when they get it. We need to understand that when God gives something to us, that it still belongs to him. It's not ours. It's what He has provided for us and He allows us to use it and enjoy it for a time. But also remember, because when he, because it does belong to Him, we have no right to get mad or upset if He takes it away or if He never gives it to us in the first place. So we need, we need to remember to thank God every day for what He's provided for us. I've heard the, the saying that God didn't forget to wake you up this morning, so don't forget to thank Him today for what He's done for you. Another time that Jesus prayed is in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. So Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives and His disciples followed Him. Upon reaching the place, He said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him to strengthen him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, Luke records just one time that Jesus went away to pray. But when you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew records three times when he left his apostles to pray. He went and prayed, and then he returned, and he found them sleeping. He woke them up and told them they needed to be praying. And he went and prayed again. And then he came back, and he found them sleeping again. Woke them up told them they needed to be in prayer. And then he went and prayed again. See, Jesus was facing the most difficult trial of his life. He was facing his death. He was about to suffer an unimaginable pain, which would end with him dying on a cross. Knowing that he was facing this difficult time, he prayed, in a, in a moment of human weakness, he prayed that God would take it away from him. That God would provide another way to save the world from their sins. However, he also prayed that if that's not possible, that God's will, not his will, would be done. Jesus knew his reason for coming to earth. He knew his purpose for becoming a man. But in a moment of human weakness, he prayed that God would give him the necessary strength to fulfill his mission. And in response, God sent an angel to strengthen him. However, even with the angel giving him strength, he still prayed hard enough that his sweat was like blood. Christ prayed a prayer of agony. <coughs> Christ prayed a prayer for strength. And more importantly, Christ prayed a prayer that God's will would be done. Following Christ's example, we need to pray when we face trials and we face temptations in life. Jesus was tempted to flee from his upcoming trial. Yet because he spent time in prayer that God's will would be done instead of his, he aligned his will with God's will and he resisted temptation through his prayer. What are you facing in your life today? Are you praying that God removes your temptation or your trial? And that if it's not His will to remove it, that He'll at least help you get through it? 
We need to pray as Jesus did. We need to pray that not our will, but the will of God be done in our lives. So now that we looked at a few examples of when Jesus prayed, we want to look at one of the prayers that gets overlooked a lot of times that Christ prayed. We're going to look at the high priestly prayer of Christ. We're going to look at the first part of it today where Jesus prayed for himself. We're going to look to see what we can learn from it. But first, I need to set the stage for you. That Jesus and his apostles had just finished their Passover feast. Jesus had washed their feet. He'd established the Lord's Supper. Judas had left to betray Christ. I am tongue tied this morning. This was the last evening that Christ would spend with his, with his apostles. But it was drawing to an end. They were about to leave the upper room and go to the Garden of Gethsemane where he would pray what we had just talked about. Christ began his prayer in John chapter 17 by praying for himself. And we find this in verses 1 through 5. It says, After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you have granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work that you've given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. See, Jesus was about to complete his mission. He was about to suffer and die a horrible death as a perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world. And he asked God to use his life, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection to glorify him so that his sacrifices would bring glory to God. The church, which is built on Christ, was to be established to worship God for what he had done for us through Christ. See, it's through Christ and His sacrifices that God forgives us of our sins. That God gives us eternal life. It's through a relationship with Christ that we can have a relationship with God. It's through Christ's name that God answers our prayers. It's through Christ that God is glorified. As Christ prayed, God gave him authority to give you and to give me and to give every believer in Christ eternal life. Only God can grant eternal life. But he gave that authority to his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was about to pay the penalty for our sins. And because of that, God gave him the authority. Jesus prayed that everyone would come to know God through His work on earth that God had sent Him to do. It's only through the one that God sent. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can know the only true God and have eternal life with Him. That is the only way that we can be saved is through Jesus Christ. There's no other way. I don't care what you hear. There's no other way to salvation than through Jesus Christ. Throughout his entire life and through the upcoming suffering and death that he was about to face, Jesus brought glory to God. His mission on earth was to bring God glory. And he knew that his work was about to be completed. Knowing that, he prayed. He was about to complete his mission by dying on the cross for each and every one of us. After he had finished his suffering, Jesus knew that he would be resurrected. He knew that he would return to his glory in heaven. But he prayed that God would return him to that glory that he had before the world began. See, Jesus was with God 
before the beginning of creation. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God. He was part of creation. And because of that, He longed to return to His glory. And see, like Christ, God has given each and every one of us a mission to complete. Each of us has a different mission that God has designed for us to do. The question is, are you working on your mission? If you're not, you need to get started. You need to pray that God will help you get started. Whatever it is that God has called us to do, we need to pray that He receives the glory in what we do. Not us. We don't take the credit. We let God get the credit. When we do what God has called us to do, we need to make sure He gets the glory. We don't need to seek glory for ourselves. We need to seek glory for God. And Jesus, who was God, was returning to His glory. You see, we are to make sure that God gets the glory for everything that we do. Another thing that we can learn from this prayer is it's okay for us to pray for ourselves. Jesus prayed for Himself. But if Jesus did it and we're to follow His example, why can't we pray for ourselves? There's a lot of people out there, maybe even some here this morning, that just don't pray for yourselves. But it's okay to pray for yourselves. If you have a need, it's okay to ask God to meet that need. But however, we also remember that when we pray for ourselves, or we first and foremost, we ask that God's will be done, not our will. Amen. We need to ask that He gets the glory for what He does through us instead of us getting the glory. We need to ask that He gives us the strength to complete the mission that He sent us to do. So when we look at the prayers of Christ, we need to understand that He took communication with God very seriously. He would spend entire nights in prayer. He would give thanks for God's provisions. He prayed for strength during trials, temptations. He asked that God be glorified in all that He did. He asked that God's will be done. And we are to follow Christ's example. So we need to spend significant time in prayer when we're facing difficult, life-changing decisions, seeking strength and guidance in God's will. We need to pray when we face trials and temptations. We need to pray that God will help us complete our mission and that He will get the glory instead of us. We also need to pray for God's protection. We also need to pray for God's healing. We need to pray for each other. Prayer is how Christ communicated with God. Prayer is how we communicate with God. Are you praying? How is your prayer life? Do you have a weak prayer life? If you do, you can ask God to help you grow a strong prayer life. And if you have a strong prayer life, you need to, get to allow God to get the glory for what He does through your prayers. This morning, at our time of invitation, if your prayer life is not where it needs to be, ask God to guide you. Ask God to help you. But this morning, we also want to give time and allow time for us to pray for each other. Whatever your need, whatever your trial, whatever your temptation this morning, whatever difficult decision you're facing, Lay it at the foot of the cross this morning. Christ is listening. But if you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't have a relationship with Him, but you desire to know the one true God, like I said, He is the only way to salvation. So you need to give your life, give your heart to Christ this morning. God will forgive you of your sins. He'll grant you eternal life through Christ. And He'll set you on the mission that He started for you.